Welcome. Thank you for joining us today, the Printing Museum's book discussion of the bookseller of Florence. My name is Adrian O'Donnell, and I'm the Educations Program Manager at the Printing Museum. My virtual background is our wonderful lobby for the Printing Museum. We're in Houston, Texas, and we have been here for about 40 years. We are one of Houston's hidden gems. We hope we don't remain hidden, that you all come and visit us if you can. Uh, so not only do we have our museum, but we also have rotating gallery exhibits and we have working artist studios where we have a paper making studio, a letterpress studio and a book bindery. So we have workshops, we have guided tours with hands on opportunities to use the printing presses. Oh, no. We have a lot going on. Oh no. <laughs> you are right there, Matt. I'm going to be handing it over here to Matt in a minute. Oh, so. Darn. Not a problem. I will continue introducing everything. So today we have one of our docents, Matt Adams, who is doing one of our first book discussions for us in this series. Uh, we hope to have more in the future. So we are going to be having a presentation from Matt. If you've got any questions, any comments, anything you'd like to say, uh, if you think of them, feel free to put them in the chat as you think of them. We'll have time at the end where we can do Q&A and go over any questions or comments or anything like that at the end. So I will be around to help with the chat um, or anything else that you need, Matt. And otherwise, I'm going to be handing it off to you now. Outstanding. And I'm going to get the uh, share screen going. Uh, so in front of me now is the book that we're going to be talking about. Don't know if anyone has uh, pre-purchased this. That was kind of the idea to do with um, this talk is give people a chance to go buy the book and we could not have a dialogue about it, but you know, at least you have some familiarity with it. Uh, so this uh, my share screen is looking good. Uh, so my name is Matt Adams. I'm a docent at the Printing Museum and Adrian knows that I'm a student of Renaissance Florence. And when this book came out, she said, hey, Matt, you need to get this book. I said, I absolutely do. Um, then the idea came of doing this uh, presentation for you guys. So I'm really looking forward to doing this. Uh, and this certainly does not need to be the end of a conversation about a very important topic, but rather a beginning. Uh, so with that, I'd like to launch into uh, Ross King's, the bookseller of Florence. And this is my little snarky kind of uh, tagline, the arrogant business owner who fought against a new medium, because this is, it's actually a very modern story uh, for, you know, you remember going from vinyl records to eight tracks to cassettes, uh, the change of medium uh, sees opportunities for some and some get left behind as medium changes. And this is definitely a case study in how um, a new technology, a new medium uh, has a larger effect on economies. And that's not immediately obvious. So I wanna start with that, uh, start with that um, comment for you. So as we go on, I wanna show you what we're gonna be talking about. We're gonna introduce the protagonist of the story, Vespasiano da Bitici. We're going to talk about humanism and prominent humanists. This lays the groundwork for everything. I'm gonna talk about some of the ancient texts that Ross King uh, brings, to, uh, brings to the story. I'm gonna talk about the development of script uh, or typeface, if you will. We're going to talk about Plato's works. Uh, this is a very important uh, topic that we need to get into. I'm going to discuss some public libraries, in particular the San Marco Library in Florence. Then I'm going to talk about how printing changed the world. Uh, it seems pretty obvious, but it's kind of the core of this book. And then as much as Ves Vespasiano came into our lives, he, lo he left our lives, and I'd like to address that. Um, as we go on, most but you know, 90% of what I'm going to be talking about is directly lifted from Ross King's book. However, there are some things that I just really felt impressed I needed to share with you that is not in the book. So I'm going to mention some things, but you're going to know what they are because I have them in italics. And I'll be very clear as to this is not in the book, but it certainly does 
um, provide good uh, contextualization to, to the story. So with that said, let's get to Vespasiano de Bittici. Uh, Vespasiano, uh, the who, what, why. So that is who we're going to be talking about. Where did he exist? You should already know. Uh, that was uh, Florence, Italy. Uh, when? Uh, this is in the Italian Renaissance. He was born about 1422. And this was about 20 years after humanists began hunting for ancient texts. Uh, so the Renaissance generally is considered to start around 1400. Um, and as we're gonna say a few times, uh, the Renaissance is based in literature uh, and the seeking of ancient text is critical to that. So when he was born, wasn't at the exact beginning of this, just as it was starting. Uh, so this was a really good time for, him, for um, someone uh, to get involved um, in the ancient text hunt. Uh, what was he? Uh, what was he? He was a media mogul. Obviously, that's a modern term that I'm using, but he was quite the player in the production of manuscripts. So his medium, uh, this is literary content, and the medium is handwritten manuscripts. And he was he he was the king um, throughout Italy and arguably throughout Europe um, in controlling this media. How did he do that? Uh, he gathered texts, ancient texts. Uh, he hired scribes to copy them, and he would bind them into very high quality handmade text. We will see one later. Uh, and why are we talking about him today? <laughs> you know, what, why does anyone even care about this guy? Well, his contribution to the humanism machine is significant. Uh, and when I say that, I mean that humanism began with acknowledging ancient Greek, ancient Roman societies and their literature he would have these copied and distributed and sold. And that would increase the interest in humanism. And then he had more customers to make manuscripts for. And with more customers came more interest in humanism. So it's a machine. It's a machine that uh, he was critical in uh, being a part of. Interestingly, we do not know exactly what he looks like. That's why I've got no image available. For such an important person, I think it's amazing that we don't know what he looks like. Uh, and then the little map showing you uh, where Florence is. Okay, so prominent humanists. Uh, so the, these are the guys that um, laid the groundwork of, um, no, sorry. Yeah, sorry, humanism, <laughs> I apologize. Uh, so this is not in the book. So I've said the word hum humanist, humanism a few times. This has got to be very well understood in order to go forward. I think it's very fair to quote the Oxford Dictionary. What is humanism? Humanism is an outlook or system of thought attaching prime importance to human rather than divine or supernatural matters. Humanist beliefs, stress the potential value and goodness of human beings, emphasize common human needs, and it seeks solely rational ways of solving human problems. That is what humanism is. So we're seeing the uh, departure from the reliance on uh, Christianity and how we view the world and our own lives. This was done primarily through a revival of ancient Greek, Roman and Arabic literature, art, law, and science. Humanist interest include primarily for the purpose of this presentation, collecting manuscripts, uh, using agents, because of course you're gonna send, send your people out to France to get these manuscripts. Then you hire people to copy these manuscripts, because uh, this is obviously before printing press. And you would have manuscripts translated, or you would understand uh, numerous languages to do your own translation. Humanists were also very interested in importing artworks, again, ancient artworks from faraway lands, uh, collecting gems and other precious artifacts were something that humanists like to do, 
and most importantly, they commune with other humanists. Uh, let's say I, you know, I, a book hunter that I hired brought back this manuscript. I'm not going to keep it to myself. I'm going to loan it to my friends so that they can make a copy of it. I'm going to talk about the ideas in it, and we're going to debate the ideas. Uh, all this intercommunication happened regardless of your rank in society, um, how educated you were, how much money you had. None of that mattered when it came to humanism. Humanism is where everyone came together on common ground. Trade had everything to do with this uh, as the Italians in particular uh, traveled to the Levant, for example, they would bring back ideas that uh, were from that area. And it's very important to point out that humanism did not displace Christian beliefs or practices. Uh, rather, they lived side by side uh, and it, it was very comfortable. There was not conflict in resolving Christian beliefs with these ancient Roman beliefs, these uh, uh, pagan beliefs. Uh, these existed side by side in everyone's lives. So that's a little about um, humanism. Now I want to talk about prominent humanists that Ross King uh, educates us about in his book. Um, these three I have grouped together because they were friends, they were colleagues. Most importantly, all three of them learned Greek from the same instructor in 1397. They all were in Greek class together. Uh, before that time, Greek did not exist in Florence. Um, you know, Dante, he could not read Greek. That's why he wrote in the vernacular, because there was no Greek in Florence until 1397. And that uh, um, is something that binds uh, these three fellows together. Uh, now, in particular, Poggio Baccolini, he was a book hunter. And there's a fun story that Ross King shares with us, and that he and some friends uh, went to the Abbey of St. Gall, which is in Switzerland. And he went there knowing, su uh, supposing that there were ancient texts there. And sure enough, they found a copy of Quintilian's Instituto Oratoria. This was a text that was known, but had been lost for over 500 years. He and his friends just, uh, if you uh, pardon, they came unglued. <laughs> they were so excited and actually tried to buy the manuscript from the monks uh, at the abbey. And the monks said, no, no, no it's, it's gonna have to stay here. So Poggio stayed for 32 days and he transcribed, he made a copy of that most important text. Uh, Bruni, um, he, he was a translator. He was a translator and he provided commentary on texts that he would translate. Um, this was a very humanist thing is to put your own uh, spin on these ancient texts. He became the best-selling author of the 1400s. Um, his brilliance extended to the political sector. Uh, he became the chancellor of Florence in 1437. And interestingly, he wrote a pro-Aristotle biography saying uh, in defense of people being rich, uh, he said, quote, it is the opinion of wise men that such enhancement of fortune is not blameworthy if it does not harm anyone. For riches can serve as an aid to such virtues as magnanimity and liberality, and they are useful to the Republic. So that's one way the very rich people who were um, charging um, interest on loans against Christian beliefs, they would make a lot of money. And we had humanists such as Bruni saying, being rich is okay. Uh, Niccolo Nicolai uh, is considered by his friend Poggio, the most learned citizen in Florence. Uh, he was friends with some Renaissance names you might be familiar with, uh, Brunelleschi, Donatello, and Ghiberte. Uh, these were all friends. Interestingly, he took a mistress from one of his five brothers. Uh, so he didn't always consider his, his, his family's interest. And in particular, he sold a lot of his father's um, assets 
after he died in order to buy books. And that did not go over well with his brothers either. He did have, a, uh, he ended up owning about 800 volumes. Some of these were 500 years old. He was very opinionated against Dante uh, he, in saying that uh, pages of the Divide Comedy are only good for wrapping fish and meat. He only respected antique Latin works done by Christian scribes and writers. Uh, he considered anything done within the previous thousand years uh, to be corrupt. Uh, he was quite a purist, if I can use that word. Uh, he was quite the purist. Now he did kind of put his money where his mouth was and that he um, developed his own script that he considered was true, that was perfect and beautiful. And we'll see that in a few minutes. Uh, very important that he wanted all of his manuscripts to be kept intact as a single collection after his death. And importantly, he wanted it to be made available to the public. As a result, uh, 16 uh, trustees were named in his will to keep his collection intact. And we're going to see more of that later. Uh, so those three guys uh, were followed, well, contemporary with, uh, but um, they were very much grouped in that they were all translators and Greek educated. Now we can bring in some other names, uh, important humanists at the time. Uh, Cosimo de' Medici, probably the best known uh, name on this list. Uh, he was uh, the unofficial ruler of Florence. He was the Pope's banker. Um, he was a very pious man. Um, and going back and referencing the compatibility of humanism and Christianity, um, his attitudes formed a lot of the attitudes uh, within Florence at this time in resolving those two different belief systems. Uh, his, Vespasiano was a good friend of his and uh, provided us with a great biography of Cosimo. Um, we're going to talk about the San Marco Library, which was Cosimo's uh, at greater length. And also, he was the one that secured the only copy of the complete works of Plato that existed. And we're going to talk about that more also. So remember the name Cosimo de' Medici. We go to a, uh, a tutor that he hired for his kids, uh, Marsilio Ficchino. Uh, Marsilio, very, very important um, humanist of the time. He read Bruni's translations of Plato, became a fan of Plato that affected the rest of his life. He wrote treatises on many subjects, including quite a list, economics, pleasure, magnificence, justice, the appetite, divine fury, and comfort for parents that lost children. Quite an accomplished author. <laughs> Uh, he began translating Cosimo's Plato in 1464, finished that in 1482, after Cosimo's death. And he got it printed as San Jacopo di Ripoli, which we will talk about. By the early 1480s, editions of four of Ficchino's works had already been printed by seven publishers in four cities. He was an early author, having original works go to print and made a living off his own writings. That brings us now to Angelo Polizano, uh, being born in uh, 1454. He studied Greek uh, with Ficchino, translated some of the Iliad into Latin at age 16. Uh, Lorenzo de' Medici, Cosimo's grandson, uh, brought him into his circle of humanist friends, uh, gave him a place within his palace and his library. Uh, Polizano is considered the greatest classical scholar of his century. Uh, this brings us to some ancient texts. Uh, I'm gonna talk about the content of the text and then the materials that were used to produce these manuscripts. Uh, so first of all, the content of these texts. Uh, so these names are familiar to you. Uh, Plato, Aristotle, Homer, the years that I'm giving you are the median years of their lifetime. Uh, so obviously Homer uh, is the oldest one. So these ancient texts uh, in the humanistic environment, uh, these ancient texts were vital 
in religious and political discussions and dealings. Uh, the scholars gathered, they discussed them, and they challenged the authority of these writings. Uh, therefore, translating the original Greek into the modern Latin was of the utmost importance at this time. Locating the best ancient source was the key to winning these kinds of theological arguments. Uh, translators used as many copies of texts as they could in order to develop an authoritative, and you see I'm doing air quotes, <laughs> you know, what was the authoritative text of, for example, uh, the Iliad, uh, which is kind of hard to say because the Iliad being uh, first recited in the eighth century BCE, the Odyssey is about 12,000 lines of text. The Iliad is almost 16,000 lines of text. Uh, so finding an authoritative was certainly a, a point of discussion and controversy. Uh, the oldest existing manuscript of it is actually from the third century BCE. Uh, we do know that Petrarch had a copy of it. Uh, the finest copy is a 10th century manuscript on parchment. It was obviously a very difficult translation job uh, to keep the hexameter of the poem in Greek into Latin. Uh, so some of the uh, uh, information on the ancient text content, uh, now switching to the materials. Um, so there are many materials and this goes back to what I said at the very beginning, as media changes, do you keep up with it or do you hold on to the old? We know that ancient texts began in clay and uh, then incorporated palm leaves, scratching on the palm leaves, which you can see when you come visit us at the museum. Uh, wax tablets, papyrus, again in the museum, parchment, again in the museum, and obviously paper. Uh, so the substrates changed over time, and Ross King talks a lot about the um, papyrus to parchment um, and parchment to paper transition because these materials did fall apart. Um, a lot of these texts uh, that survived came out of monasteries because they were very well cared for. And uh, the monks would recognize that, hey, this particular text is falling apart, so we need to copy it onto new material. Uh, so there's a lot about that in, uh, in his book, the papyrus to parchment transition that occurred from about 300 to 400 CE. <laughs> uh, uh, it's interesting to point out that parchment availability depended on local cuisine preferences. Uh, so if one particular city preferred to eat sheep over goat, over a cow, then the parchment or membrane material that was used in these manuscripts uh, would be then sheep. Whereas if you go to an area of the country that preferred beef, well, it would be cow skins that would be used. It was only in 1260 uh, that the first Italian paper maker opened shop. Uh, the technology came directly from Spain to Italy, again in 1260. I'd like to do a book reading for you um, regarding the ink that was used for text. So I'd like to quote, um, quote I'm sorry, uh, Ross King on page 106, quote, the scribe dips the quill into one of the two ink horns. One holds black ink, the other red. The main ingredients for the former are wine and the barks and saps from various trees, including oak galls, the small tannin wrench lumps that grow on the twigs of oak trees where gall flies lay their eggs. One Italian recipe for black ink advised taking four ounces of crushed galls and mixing them with a bottle of strong white wine, pomegranate rinds, bark from a mountain ash, the root of a walnut tree, and gum arabic, the sap from an acacia tree. These ingredients were left in the sun and stirred every few hours. Into this concoction were added, after a week, a few ounces of Roman vitrol, or copper sulfate. The mixture then sat a few days longer and was regularly stirred. Then it was placed over the fire and boiled for as long as it took to recite the 19 verses of Psalm 51. Next, the bubbling black liquor was cooled, strained through linen, 
and left to sit in the sun for two more days. Quote, if you then put, put it in a little rock alum, it will make it much brighter, the recipe claimed, and it will be good and perfect writing ink, end quote, end quote. Uh, so now we have an appreciation for maybe when you just take that pen out of your, out of your purse or out of your drawer and you just write something with your pen. Uh, back in these days of manuscripts, uh, that wasn't the case. Uh, so thank you, Ross, for that uh, detailed uh, description. Uh, another detail that he provides um, is information on all the different paints that were used, uh, manufactured different paints, uh, and gold leaf. Uh, by the way, here's your trivia question answer. How thick was Renaissance or pre-Renaissance era gold leaf? It was one three hundred thousandth of an inch thick. There's a good trivia question for you and your friends. Also to make these manuscripts, it's not just the scribe putting the words to paper, so to speak, uh, but other materials such as leather, twine, various metals, various woods, uh, were used for binding and decoration of these texts. So I want to give you an example of uh, an illuminated manuscript. In this case, uh, this is a gradual, uh, gradual of the Trinity from 1453. Uh, this is not in the book, but this is, I think, um, a way to gain appreciation for these volumes. So this is a uh, a gradual on parchment. I'm going to bring up my laser pointer. So we have a fellow here, and I hope your screen is big enough that you can see this. Uh, so here we have a fellow dressed in black and white, so we know that he is a Dominican. And he's actually reaching out to a figure outside the frame. There's a dog breathing fire down here. And here I'm going to show him a little closer for you. And you get a sense for the artistry that is used in these illuminated manuscripts. Uh, here's our Dominican monk with his lily, so he's a martyr of some sort, uh, reaching out to these two characters. And down here at the bottom of the frame, I'm gonna zoom in on this, is this fire breathing dog. Isn't he awesome looking? Of course, he's black and white because again, this is a Dominican uh, gradual that is here, but look at the colors, the line quality, so many things we can talk about artistically um, on this. Uh, illuminated manuscript. This is, these are actually photos that I took in the San Marco library uh, that I want to share with you. And after this, also in the San Marco library, uh, I want to show you a book that was bound by our friend Vespasiano in 1448. Uh, so here is a gradual, as I just showed you, uh, it's not the same one, but you see, see a scale of it in this giant display case. And it's opened up and you can see those two leaves. Uh, to the left of it is what we're gonna look at, but I'm showing you for scale's sake, look at the size of this, it can't be opened in this case. It's gargantuan. Here's a view from the top of it. Um, so this, uh, I would love to get inside this book. We can't do that, but we can look at the outside and here we're talking about the uh, different metals that are used. Um, um, the, the binding of this that came out of Vespasiano's shop. Uh, look at these leaves. This is parchment. This is not paper. Uh, this is very, very high grade parchment. Uh, this would be uh, hand worked over the period of weeks to get such fine writing surface, so smooth and so thin. This is just incredible craftsmanship in uh, the, the processing of the membrane. And then we can see these uh, perhaps leather coated clapboards. We see this metalwork uh, up a little closer. Uh, there's just so much uh, quality in this binding. It, it's incredible. And this uh, last detail is the middle of the book. Uh, all these medallions, it's the middle of the book. And you might recognize the red balls on the gold background. And this is the family crest of the Medici. Uh, so we assume that a member of the Medici family commissioned this volume and with it being in the family church of San Marco we're not surprised about that whatsoever. But look at the craftsmanship that Vespasiano's workshop um, exhibited uh, even on today's eyes. I, I 
am very, very impressed, you know, with this, with this work. So that's a little bit about ancient texts, the content and the materials used. Uh, and I said, we're going to look at some examples of script. Uh, so first off, it's a big blank screen, isn't it? Because before about 800 CE, we just don't have extant examples of uh, actual script. We get to about 800 to 1100 CE, and we have the script shown here. This is uh, a scan from Ross King's book. This is called Carolingian script. This came from the northern part of modern France. We can see that it's rounded and separated, uh, relatively easy to read. You know, if you can read uh, ancient uh, Greek, ancient Latin, you can understand what this is. Um, but I, I, it's easier to compare to what we're gonna see next, which also came from north of France, but a little bit later around the 1150s, uh, the Gothic, this was the Gothic uh, time. So Gothic architecture, uh, Gothic art, Gothic design, Gothic text, Gothic meant modern. Uh, so this is just considered Gothic text. And I think this is, quite a, I think this is a lot harder to read than what we saw, but it was the modern style and so it's what was used. Following this, jumping to about 1400, uh, we get to our friend Poggio Bracciolini. And I told you that he did not regard anything from the previous thousand years of being of value. It, uh, only things older than that were pure and he developed a text, his own handwriting. This is his own handwriting. Uh, very impressive even today, I think. And this style of writing was adopted uh, by other humanists, by other translators, by scribes at the time, uh, initially being called antique letters because it was based on uh, the writing back to the Carolingian script that we just saw and uh, gained enough traction that it has uh, come to be referred to in today's world as humanistic script. Uh, so these are some examples that uh, King gives us in his book of script. Now let's talk a little bit about Plato. This is a figure that everyone has heard of, but not everyone has an appreciation for the importance of Plato's works and how it affected uh, the entire world. Uh, let's go back to where it started. Uh, 376 BCE, Plato was writing. Um, he, he had students, including Aristotle. Aristotle was 16 and Plato was 72. And they would hang out and they would debate things. And the Aristotle versus Plato arguments began. Uh, and they continued for years and decades and centuries. The Aristotle versus Plato argument. Uh, Ross King gives a lot of background on the history of this argument. Um, and it links to the conflict between the Eastern and Western Catholic churches, which leads us to 1439 and the Council of Basel, which then moved to Ferrara, which then moved to Florence. And it was this Eastern and versus Western Catholic Church schism that ended up in Florence. Well, because Cosimo de' Medici pulled some strings. Uh, but regardless, because of this conflict, Cosimo somehow got the only complete works of Plato that existed into his own hands. And we know it came with George Gemestos Pletho to Florence by way of this council. We don't know exactly how Cosimo got it, but the point is he did and he recognized as a humanist, he recognized the importance of these writings. And he got his, not employee, but his, his favorite translator um, to translate it, which uh, Facchino did from 1464 to 1482. Uh, and there was then one manuscript, you know, a handwritten, you know, that's what manuscript is. There's one manuscript 
Uh, and then it was printed in Florence uh, because Facchino saw this is, needs to be the first printed book in Florence. Uh, and we'll talk about that. Uh, Facchino's translation of it, not the original Greek, was used for other translations around the world. Um, so into French, into German, into English, for example, um, it was Facchino's translation that is considered the best, uh, the best prime source. And then how Plato's writings have affected everything since then, uh, I'm just going to leave that statement there because Ross King uh, explains it very, very well. Another topic discussed in the book is public libraries, and this is very important for many reasons. Uh, so let's go back to ancient Rome, in particular, uh, 60, 66 BCE, we do see the formation of a library in ancient Rome. And this is contemporaneous with Julius Caesar, who thought, hey, I'm an important guy and I, I need to have a library too. So he uh, started the ball rolling for that, but he wasn't able to see it into fruition before he died, but it did, uh, it did happen, it did happen. Uh, and there ended up being, that we know of, over 20 public libraries in ancient Rome. Uh, and these were located in, for example, temples and palaces and the baths. And Constantinople, when Constantine moved the Roman capital east, uh, he said, we have to have a library here. Uh, so this was about the year 330 CE. Um, we think that Constantine developed a library of 120,000 volumes, just immense, absolutely immense. And boy, if the, the destruction of 1453 didn't happen, imagine what the world would be like today. And if some of you are saying, hey, Matt, what about the, uh, the Great Library in Alexandria? Why isn't that on that list? Uh, it's not mentioned in Ross King's book. I'm not sure why. Uh, flashing forward to Renaissance Rome, uh, remember I mentioned um, Nicola Nicolai's, uh, I, I'm sorry, no, no, no. Uh, this was Nicholas V's collection. This was a humanist pope that had a large collection uh, of his own that he formed, that he moved into the Curia. And Pope Sixtus IV, he recognized the value of that and he established the first lending library out of the Vatican. And Pope Sixtus, the guy that commissioned the Sistine Chapel and either created Michelangelo's greatness or destroyed it, depending on who you talk to. And the same guy that would hire his, uh, bring his own nephews in as bishops. And that's where we get the term nepotism. Uh, yeah, it's that same guy. Yeah, Pope Sixtus IV. Uh, in Renaissance Rome, uh, I'm sorry, Renaissance Venice, in 1469, an important, this was a Catholic humanist, uh, Cardinal Beseriasen. He had book hunters out for 15 years uh, looking for ancient text. He ended up procuring 746 titles. And he bequeathed that to Venice because um, he just thought that was the best place for it. But it took about 100 years for the library to actually be built out. Uh, this was within San Marco uh, in Venice. But there's an interesting connection here to the printing museum. Uh, when you come to a tour there, uh, you're going to see a leaf from the great Venetian printer, Aldus Minichius, who had access to Viseriasen's library before it was actually uh, built out, made available to the public. So there's a nice connection to the museum there. Okay, now uh, the library of San Marco, finally, after mentioning this a couple times, let's talk a little bit about the library at San Marco. So Cosimo de' Medici, he, I'm gonna air quote, donated 10,000 florins for the convent and reconciliation of his usury. Usury being the charging of interest on loans which he, he was a banker and he loaned money to many private uh, and public um, organizations, for example, the Pope um, or various other princes and kings uh, throughout Europe. And he, he had a reckoning and he asked the Pope who was in town for that same, um, that council that I mentioned before, 
So the Pope was in town and, and Cosimo said, you know what, I feel kind of bad for this usury. What can I do? And the Pope said, well, give us 10,000 florins because there's this church, this, uh, this convent called San Marco that I want to get renovated and bring in some new monks. And Cosimo said, great, I'm going to do it. Uh, so he has this entire convent renovated, rebuilt with his favorite architect, Michelozzo. And he decided to put a library in it. And again, he's thinking as a humanist, these ancient texts should be shared. So he had Michelozzo design a library. And what I'm showing you, so this is one of my pictures of the interior of the San Marco library. Uh, I'm showing you and I'll... Um, uh, okay, so the background on how it was um, put together, there were only 400 volumes of Nicolai's collection that were there in 1444. Many were out on loan. Uh, some were sent to Rome and some for dowries for his niece. Uh, Cosimo eventually had the missing text either recovered or replaced. Uh, and who did he hire to make those manuscripts? Vespasiano. This is the link between these two men. Now he asked another humanist, Tommaso Parentuccelli, who later became Pope Nicholas V, uh, Parentuccelli to generate a list of works that would create the finest library that existed. Uh, so Parentuccelli made this list of books uh, that were missing out of Nicolai's library. Cosimo handed that list over to Vespasiano and said, please make all of these books, uh, which he did, <laughs> resulting in a fantastic uh, library. The benches, this, this is uh, fun to point out, the benches are made of cypress wood. Uh, if you've ever smelled fresh cut cypress, it's quite a nice smell and it contradicts the smell of parchment that certainly the space would have reeked of. You see these, the, the benches, again, I'm gonna do my laser pointer. So in the bottom right-hand corner, um, this photo is not from Ross King's book, but this shows the type of bench. There were 64 of these benches in San Marco. Uh, so you sit here on this bench and you would read a book here. This book would be chained down here where your knees would be and the titles of the books available on that bench, because you can't move them because they're chained, were listed on this directory. So here is a directory of the books that were available to you if you sat on this bench. They would be in front of you, you would pull the book out and you could enjoy the book at your leisure. And when you were done, you would put it away. So you went to the books, the books didn't come to you. Uh, on these uh, wonderfully smelling uh, Cypress wood benches. Uh, so I want to point out to you uh, that Cosimo's grandson, Lorenzo de' Medici, he built a second public library in Florence in the other family church. He used Michelangelo as the architect for that. Not Michelozzo. So we have Cosimo hired Michelozzo, Lorenzo hired Michelangelo, and these are the first two public libraries since antiquity, both uh, due to the Medici family. Uh, all right, so now I've got three slides. Printing changes the world, uh, slide number one. So uh, just to make sure you know a little bit of your um, European geography, I'm gonna show you Germany and Mainz, Germany, uh, and under that is Italy and in the middle of Italy is Rome. All right, so the ancient evolution of media, again, that ancient evolution of media included clay to papyrus to parchment to paper. It also included the change of a scroll format and papyrus was rolled into scrolls to the codex format, which was uh, used when you had parchment and paper and in today's term, what we call a book. Well, it's called a codex. Around 1450, Johannes Gutenberg, he invented three things. Uh, you always think of the printing press, of course. You have to also think of the ink that he invented and the metal movable type that he invented. 
And when you come to the museum, we can go into this in a much greater detail. Uh, but it's important to point out here that the spread of printing throughout Europe was uh, accelerated by a religious conflict that happened in Mainz uh, in 1462. And at that time, there were uh, 800, 800 people exiled, including a lot of printers. And some of those printers uh, went into Italy, went outside Rome, and set up a print shop with the new technology of the movable metal type, the new ink, and the press that was used. And it's interesting that these monks printed classical text, not religious text. Uh, and that contrast with what Gutenberg's friends, his, uh, his cohorts, uh, Fust and Schoffer, uh, were doing in Mainz. And it's because of what they did, the monks did, that Fust and Schoffer quickly saw the market for humanist texts and started printing humanist texts um, back up into Germany. Uh, by 1468, uh, more than 100 titles had been printed across Europe, almost 100 of them in Germany alone. And at that time, it was Gothic type uh, that was being used. And so, of course, all these texts were in ancient, uh, ancient Greek, not the modern Latin. Uh, the spread of the industry throughout Europe is something to talk more about. That's a huge rabbit hole. Uh, please come to the museum because I love talking about that. <laughs> uh, let's, let's keep our eyes on the book and in particular Florence. Uh, so printing gets to Florence. It, boy, did it have a hard going, but it had hard going in all the cities in Europe. This was not a new technology that just uh, became a goose of the golden egg. Uh, to whoever decided to get into the business. No, not at all. So the difficulty that happened in Florence happened throughout Europe. Uh, but in Florence in particular in 1470, the first printer that was in Florence, Bernardo Cennini, he was a goldsmith, um, as was Gutenberg, having a background in goldsmithing. Um, uh, but Cennini had actually worked with Ghiberti, the great goldsmither of Renaissance Florence. In order to start his business, he had to sell one of his houses, he mortgaged another house, and he got a 200 florin loan to start up his shop. Boy, that was a lot of capital. Uh, his first book was a Latin commentary on Vigil uh, that he printed in 1471, but he couldn't sell his product. Uh, it was not a good translation, uh, the printing wasn't well done, and he just couldn't sell his product, he went out of business. Uh, then there was a second printer in Florence that came from Mainz to uh, Florence in 1472, but he was out of work within a year also. Again, this is not just Florence. Um, this was typical in all um, cities uh, throughout Europe. Um, <laughs> and illuminators did not go out of business. Uh, the people that did the illuminations onto the manuscripts uh, indeed, they had a lot more work because print shops worked faster than scribes. So illuminators were actually quite happy around this time. Uh, continuing with this look at Europe, here is a list of the cities or, uh, you know, the, the three time, um, European countries that had uh, presses. So in Italy, there were 24 presses. In Germany, there were 13. In France, there were six. This is a good snapshot in 1475. So Italy being number one, let's drill down a little bit. And here's a list of the cities in Italy uh, and the number of presses that were uh, in each of those cities. Number one is Venice. Uh, the Venice leads happened early and lasted quite a while. Uh, followed by Rome, uh, Padua, there was a medical school and it supported the business of printing in Padua. Uh, nine in Naples, Milan, Bologna, Vincenzo Frada, and several other Italian towns had presses. Now in 1475, this was coming into the high Renaissance uh, in Florence. And the absolute, if there's one takeaway for you today, it's to figure out, to wrap your brain around why there are zero printing presses in Florence at this time. So what was in Florence, 
Now, this information is not in the book, but I think it helps. <laughs> helps you understand or maybe tilt your head in a curious fashion. Uh, so in 1475, there were 70,000 people in Florence. This supported 180 churches, 270 wool shops, 83 silk shops, 66 apothecaries, 84 wood shops, 54 sculptors and stonecutter shops, 70 butcher shops, 44 goldsmiths, and 33 banks. Again, zero printing presses. So printing was changing the world, but not Florence. Why was that? Well, there was a lot of uh, prejudice against printing. Uh, again, this is, it's a very modern thing, you know, the resistance to a new medium. Um, Angelo Polizano, one of those humanists that we've talked about, he said, quote, now the most stupid ideas can in a moment be transferred into a thousand volumes and spread abroad. So he was, he was not a fan of printing. Uh, Lorenzo de' Medici, uh, very prominent uh, banker, uh, philanthropist, humanist at the time, he despised printing so much that when Facchino did start having his writings printed, he would have those transcribed uh, into a manuscript from printed copies. Man, if you want to talk about resisting change, that's, that's it there. Um, also, another reason there were not uh, printing presses thriving in Florence is because Vespasiano was very, very successful. He was a media mogul. Uh, he didn't sell anything printed. He had a reputation for a high quality product and he was able to produce enough that the market uh, was being satiated by his shop. Uh, in 1476, we do see the development, uh, the appearance of the first uh, commercially viable printing press. And that was in a church, San Jacopo de Ripley. Uh, so a monk in there, Fra Domenico, he bought and set up a press. We don't know why. It's, we don't know why Gutenberg invented uh, the technology he invented. We don't know why these things happened, which I think is amazing. Uh, but we do know that he did, reflecting the, um, the startup issues that everyone had. His early titles were poorly done. However, by 1478, oh my goodness, he was publishing a title every three weeks and printing two to 300 copies of these titles. Interestingly enough, also non-secular. Uh, and there's an interesting, uh, there's a great book reading that I wanna share with you now that Ross King um, shares this, this story. I think it's a really fun story. So here we go. Quote, peddlers were another familiar sight selling from baskets hung around their necks, such wares as religious trinkets and other cheap souvenirs. Many were blind and begged in front of churches and some of them too became popular street performers, entertaining crowds by singing songs and reciting prayers and orations. The arrival of the printing press gave these peddlers and songsters another commercial opportunity to exploit. And the street hawkers in turn provided Fra Domenico of the Ripoli with people to sell his wares. In December, 1477, his account book recorded sales of newly printed religious pamphlets to two peddlers, Blind Angelo and Blind Cola. Among the first purveyors of print in Florence, they bought, and sometimes commissioned, copies of pamphlets containing the text of the prayers and songs they performed. Blind Cola, for instance, purchased 200 copies of Prayer on the Blood of Christ a work he probably ordered directly from Fra Domenico. He would have recited this oration in the streets and then with any luck, sold copies to passerby. He was unable to return stock to the printer. These inexpensive little tracts and flyers probably represented the first experience many people had, the poor especially, of the printed page. Almost none of the works have survived not simply because they were so cheaply produced, 
but also because of how the buyers used them. They stuck them under the walls of their homes or else folded them into amulets and used them as charms. Devotional texts were believed by the faithful to have magical powers, similar to the ugnuts and potions sold by the bench singers. Words produced mechanically on paper and print runs of 300 copies appear to have enjoyed powers every bit as potent as those inscribed by a quill on a piece of parchment. So the first experience people had with the printed page were probably because of these street performers. Fascinating story, Mr. King. Thank you for sharing that with us. Uh, this is when uh, political news uh, started being circulated. It was easy to print and uh, printers, they were seeking content. Another very modern concept of uh, being a digital distributor of content, you need content. And political news was very easy to print and it helped fund larger projects. Now note that uh, I mentioned the uh, prejudice against printing at this time. Uh, we do know that people would have bound uh, manuscript pages and printed pages. Uh, they would have those uh, bound together if they wanted to. Uh, so now we come to um, the last of uh, Vespasiano. Uh, I wanna uh, give you a little more information on him and we're gonna say goodbye because we're uh, towards the end of the book now. Um, in 1433, uh, he was 11 years old and his family was poor and he had to leave school and he became a bookbinder at the age of 11. Uh, so keep in mind this man that had a huge impact on humanists and the so-called men of letters uh, was not a man of letters himself. Uh, so it really makes us wonder uh, what his personality was like because um, he was taken in by so many of the humanists at the time uh, became their friends and then began working for them. He got his first commission at age 20, which was a collection of biblical stories. And 1445, he was a book hunter for Cosimo de' Medici. In 1453, the man that he worked for died and left his uh, bookshop to his two sons and 37 and a half percent of it uh, to Vespasiano, his longtime employee. <laughs> Vespasiano was friends with uh, Alessandro Sforza, Luca Pitti, uh, Piero de' Medici, even though these three men were enemies of one another. Uh, so at this time, the development of Renaissance era politics uh, gets very interesting and Ross King goes a lot into it. Uh, and I don't have time. I had a story I was gonna share with you, but I'll do that later, one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. Uh, but it's very interesting that he, among his many, many customers, they were political rivals to the point of actually murdering each other's family members. So he had to play nice with a lot of different kinds of characters. Uh, and a lot of those stories, um, Ross King uh, takes us into. So he's about to leave. He refused to sell printed books. He never sold a printed book. He left. Uh, he left Florence. I mean, he left, left. Uh, he was never wealthy. He never, he didn't have enough capital uh, to maintain a dying business. He didn't ever get married, perhaps a bitter old man. When he left Florence, he decided to write biographies because he knew fascinating people and he knew he knew fascinating people. So he wrote a lot of biographies uh, that have helped uh, historians up to this day. But there's an interesting quote I wanna share with you that perhaps gives us an indication of his personality. Everything in deceit, lies, cunning, theft, sodomy, wickedness, with no fear of God or concern for the world. Boy, I think he had some, uh, some bad days. Uh, he died at the age of 56 uh, and he's buried and Santa Croce in Florence with his brother, Jacopo, whose name is the only one on their tomb. So that is an overview of some of the high points of his, of Ross King's book. 
I want to share with you his YouTube channel that he launched when this book dropped. Uh, his YouTube channel is called uh, Renaissance Discoveries. And here I have a list of uh, titles. These are generally 30 to 40 minutes long. And I put in bold the episodes that directly relate to uh, this book. So I'd encourage you to hear directly from the man himself and check out his YouTube channel. So we covered a lot of ground. Um, I was much more uh, uh, linear and presenting you kind of bits and pieces of the book. Uh, please know that his storytelling uh, is more organic, more multi-layered than that. So he will go off on a bit of political history, taking, you know, starting from one point and going to another point and another point, and then coming and looping back. Uh, so it can be a dense read at time. And I wanna share with you, uh, so this is his Brunelleschi's Dome versus his Michelangelo and the Pope ceiling versus, well, where did I put it? <laughs> uh, the book we're talking about. So this is 403 pages, uh, which is 100 pages more than this one, which is 150 pages more than this one. Uh, so his, his uh, storytelling style has changed over time. Uh, so if you've been following him for a while, expect that uh, to progress. If you want to learn more about this topic, there are some other books that I can recommend. Uh, but this has been a lot to cover, and I do want to respect everyone's time. Uh, so with that said, this is the end of my prepared presentation, and I would love to open up to questions and comments. Thank you, Matt, so much. I uh, really appreciated all the in-depth information you provided and giving an overview of the book, as well as, you know, Ross King's kind of narrative style as well there at the end, comparing them to what other books people may have read, because I know I've read the other ones too. Um, just recognizing that we are kind of at time already, but if there was one or two questions, uh, feel free to unmute yourselves or put them in the chat. Um, you know, we'll maybe go three, five more minutes. It's a lot to cover. It, 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 it really is an entrance point uh, to a lot of other topics related to Renaissance Florence, but I really appreciate the fact that it's, it gets to the central point of the Renaissance, which is the rediscovery of ancient literature. Any questions? Sounds like you did a great job, Matt. There's some um, comments. I'll send those along to you too for you to read. Uh, thank you everybody for joining us so much at the uh, via Zoom. And if you're able to visit the museum, we are open on Thursday, Friday, Saturdays. We have standing tours at 1 p.m. on Saturdays. And Matt was one of our very knowledgeable docents. So if you come on the, is that the third Thursday, the, the third Saturday of the month? That's my shift, third Saturday of the month. Yeah, you can come and see Matt in action. That'd be great. All right. Well, thank you guys so much, everybody. Take care. Till next time. Bye. Bye.